Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the ANA eLearning Academy. We're very excited to have this new opportunity to get together when we're so far apart. I'd like to give a special thank you to all of our presenters that have put so much time into making this happen in such a short time. As you may have seen, we've had added a bunch of new classes onto our website. If you haven't been on in the last few weeks, I recommend getting on and checking them out. I will add the link to the um, to the classes onto the chat feature here in Zoom at the end of the presentation. During this presentation, you might come up with questions. If you do, please use the chat feature here in Zoom. Um, Rod will answer questions here throughout the presentation as well as at the end. And if we can't get to all of them before the time is done, then we will um, get the questions answered and I will send them to you. Um, if you, towards the end of the presentation, I'm gonna be sending out a survey to each of you using the poll. I do ask that all of you um, send in your answers on the, um, honestly, and then we will share them with Rod anonymously. We'd like to get feedback on how Zoom worked for you, as well as how Rod did on a presentation. Um, if there's anything I can do for you, feel free to um, send in your chat. You are all muted and we cannot see you. Just so you guys know, you can only see Rod and I, and you'll only be able to hear Rod and I the entire time. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to let me know. Um, now I'd like to introduce Rod. He is the Education Director here at the American Numismatic Association, and he's going to teach on Grading 101. Enjoy. Thank you, Brianna. Um, everyone, uh, welcome for coming today, and thank you for spending some time with me. Um, as Brianna said, my name is Rod Gillis, and I am the Education Director here at the ANA. I just celebrated my 14th anniversary, so I've been here for 14 years now. Um, and they promised me that um, they will release me as soon as I get everything right. So I could be here for quite some time. Um, I want to tell you that um, I've really enjoyed teaching grading classes, and I have taught grading classes for quite a few years now. Uh, this is the first time where I've been working solo. In the past, I've had the opportunity to work with people like um, Mike Ellis, who is a uh, current governor uh, on the ANA board. Um, I've also worked with, with Brian Fanton, who is a uh, uh, very knowledgeable in grading coins, and he's an extremely successful dealer uh, in Iowa. I've also had the opportunity to work with Bill Fiva. As a matter of fact, Bill and I worked together at the, um, the National Money Show in Atlanta uh, back in February. And as a matter of fact, uh, Bill and I had a special guest instructor that we worked with, uh, Ken Brissett. Uh, so it was really a lot of fun to work with both Bill Fever and Ken Brissett. They're both uh, Hall of Fame recipients at the ANA. And as a matter of fact, all the people that I've worked with, all the people that I've mentioned, are all numismatic ambassadors. Uh, and the reason I tell you this is because if you should decide to take one of our live grading classes, you're really going to deal with people who have been around a long time and people who know uh, how to grade. And, and love to be able to teach and are very enthusiastic about it. The time we're going to spend together today really should lay the groundwork for wanting to attend uh, one of our live classes, whether it's uh, our four-day summer seminar class or our two-day version that we often hold just before World's Fair of Money or the National Money Shows. It's a lot of fun, and uh, you should come away with a, a great deal of knowledge we work hard to make it relevant for you. And one of the ways that we do that is we have a, uh, a, a specific grading set of coins that we work with. This is a set we put uh, together especially for this class. And we do that because we want to make sure that this is a, a set of coins that you can learn from fairly easily. And one of the things we do, for example, is we make sure that the coins in our grading set are all problem free. We believe that it's difficult enough to learn how to grade, let alone try to grade with something in the back of your mind saying, well, I wonder if this coin's been fooled with anyway. I wonder if it's been cleaned. So uh, th this is a really good grading set, and you'll have the opportunity to work with them should you decide to take one of our live classes. Um, in our live classes, we have a situation where you look at a lot of coins, which we believe is extremely important. That's how you learn. And uh, you have an opportunity to grade the coins both individually and in a group setting. As a matter of fact, we divide the class up into teams. And after you've graded the coins in a group setting, we talk about the different grades uh, for the coins and we keep score. And at the end of the class, we award some really neat prizes to the 
uh, team who happen to grade most effectively. So it's a lot of fun, um, and I really encourage you to consider taking the class when you have an opportunity. First thing I want to do in talking about our class today, the time we spend together, is I want to congratulate you. And I want to congratulate you because uh, learning how to grade is not something that everyone really wants to do. And there are several reasons for that. Um, learning how to grade accurately is time consuming and there's a lot of hard work. And there's just no way of getting around that. Um, so you have to devote a considerable amount of time if you want to learn how to grade, especially if you want to learn how to grade effectively. You know, no one likes to be told that they're wrong. And that's going to happen a lot when you first begin learning how to grade. You know, we don't want to set ourselves up for failure. And while we can take classes and while we can work, there's going to be times when, you know, you're going to miss a grade. And, and who likes to be told that when you're doing something that supposedly you're doing for a lot of fun? And that happens to all of us. That happens to me all the time. You know, I'm working with one of my uh, co-instructors and I'll look at a coin and I'll say, you know, I think it's this. And they'll say, Rod, are you sure? You may have missed this, and they'll show something to me, and you know they're right. And so that happens all the time. So the point is, don't be afraid to be wrong. Um, we're all wrong at some points. Of course, the trick behind it is you want to be right more than you want to be wrong, and that's why you take classes uh, in the first place. I believe that everyone, every one of us, has the necessary talent that it takes to be able to grade. Obviously, there are some people who uh, are able to grade much better and they gravitate to it quickly. But it's my belief that every one of us can grade well enough to at least be able to grade coins that we are considering to add to our collection. I think it's really important that you keep that in mind. There are times you may be discouraged when you're learning how to grade. Let those times pass. Um, I really believe that every one of you would be able to learn how to grade effectively, giving enough work and uh, giving enough time and patience on your part. Finally, uh, before we actually get started with the class, I want to talk to you about why it's important that I believe that you learn how to grade. You know, when third-party grading companies came out, there were a lot of people who became lazy. You know, I don't know how, I don't have to learn how to grade anymore because there are people who will do it for me. And that is a good point. You know, the grading companies exist partly so that they can grade coins for you so that you don't have to. And the dirty little secret is that there are some people out there who really should be effective in grading. And by that I mean dealers. Yeah. The dirty little secret is that there are some dealers out there, and amazing as it is, when they have to uh, sell for their lively, livelihood, really aren't effective graders because they sort of let the third-party grading companies take over on that end. The danger in that is that, you know, the people who are professional graders, they're extremely good at what they do. However, they don't sit in a chair at a mountaintop and decree that a coin is such and such a grade. This coin is XF45, and it shall ever be that way. That's not how it works. Uh, their graders are human beings like you and I, and what that means is that human beings are fallible. They can make mistakes on occasions. Probably not very often, but they do make mistakes. And I don't know about you, but if I'm looking at a coin that I'm considering buying, it's a little more comforting for me to blame myself on uh, the grade of a coin and having me misgrade it than I am for having someone else who I don't even know uh, grading it for me. The other thing that I want to say is I really do believe that it's important that you learn how to grade because without learning, you're not getting everything from the hobby that you should be. Um, learning how to grade is an important part of the hobby, and if you're going to get the full flavor of the hobby, then you need to take part in grading. So those are the reasons that I want to congratulate you for taking the effort to being here with me. And that's sort of the philosophy that I have concerning grading. What we're going to do in just a moment is um, I have a PowerPoint presentation that we're going to take a look at. And uh, it's a, admittedly a lengthy one. Um, however, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break it up into two sections. 
and then we'll take that time when I uh, when we take a break that I'll accept questions or so for 10 minutes and um, and then of course we'll also do that at the end of the presentation uh, and, and we'll certainly take as many questions as time allows so that's sort of the uh, idea of what we're going to be doing and I hope that you'll be able to stay with me and uh, if you're not careful I hope that you're able to learn a little bit all right let's get started So we've already done our welcomes and, and introductions. Um, over the course of this PowerPoint presentation, we're going to define grading. We're going to talk about the evolution of coin grading, how it came to be. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the different ways of certification that we learned how to standardize grading. We're going to talk about how to examine a coin. We're also going to examine the first points of wear and focal points. And that's a basic idea of what we have uh, planned for you in the time that we spend together today. Before we actually talk about grading, let's talk about some grading myths. First myth, grades never change. Well, grades do change. There is an evolution to grading, and grades can change for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, graders uh, sometimes change their um, what they what they believe a, a grade should be. Um, they they uh, move uh, their grading standards, and that can create a change. And the other is that the actual coin can change, and I'll show you examples of that later on. But over time, a, a coin itself can change, and that could affect the grade. Myth number two. Only professionals can grade coins. Well, that's really the whole reason you're here. Certainly professionals can make their living off of grading coins, and they do. Uh, but again, uh, it's my firm belief that all of us here can uh, become accomplished enough to be able to grade coins effectively. Certainly to grade coins well enough to decide whether you can, uh, or you should be able to add them to your collection. And you know, when we teach this grading class, right before shows, uh, nothing makes the instructors feel good than when we have one of our students come up to us and say, I bought this coin and I want you to take a look at it. And we take a look at it and the vast majority of times it's a very pleasing coin. We tell them that they've done a good job. And they look at us and they say, you know what? I wouldn't have had the courage to buy this coin uh, because I, would have, I was afraid that I would misgrade it. I, don't have, I wouldn't have had the courage to buy this coin if I hadn't taken the class. And for us, that's a, that's a really good feeling. So it's a myth that only professionals can grade coins. Myth number three, a grade is either right or wrong. And within certain parameters, that is a grading myth. You know, if, if I'm looking at a coin and I grade it as a VG, let's say I grade it as a VG10 and you grade it as an eight, there's little damage done. We're in the same neighborhood. We're very close. The prices for that coin aren't that different, and there's no harm done. Of course, the problem comes is if I look at a coin and, and I graded it as, as an MS65 and you graded it as an XF40, now we have a problem. Um, so within certain parameters, there really isn't a right or wrong answer as to a specific grade on a coin. Professional graders always agree. Well, that's not true either. I've been around people who uh, are, are excellent graders, and I've seen them uh, discuss and disagree on a particular grade. Happens all the time. And I realize that there are times when we're looking at a specific grade, and the difference in another grade, even if it's close, can be in the neighborhood of tens of thousands of dollars. I realize that. But there are still disagreement among professionals, and that's important for you to keep in mind. Finally, and this is a big one, if the coin is in a mint state holder, it cannot have any wear. Well, when we teach the class, the live grading class, uh, we usually pull out gold coins at the end and have the uh, students grade our gold coins. And they look at the gold coins and they say, you know, You've taught us how to spot focal points. You've told us how to look for wear. 
And I'm sure that I'm seeing where right here. Why is it in a mint state holder? You know, the answer we've given them is, you know, you're right. Um, with specific coins, there is some allowance or tolerance for where, even though it appears in a mint state holder. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. Okay. Those of us who have been grading a long time truly believe that grading is an art and really not a science. Now, when we're talking about technical grading, especially with coins that have been uh, worn, it's certainly a matter of saying, okay, there's this much wear in this much uh, in this specific location, therefore it's this it's this particular grade. So there is a bit of science to that. But when we're looking at coins, especially mint state coins, and we're looking at things such as eye appeal, it really is an art and not so much a science. Grading, grading is an extremely subjective subject, and you always want to keep that in mind. As a matter of fact, a lot of us would tell you that grading is more art than science. I like to tell people that grading itself is really a language, and that the better off you are at understanding the language, the more successful grader you're going to become. I like to tell people that it's a shorthand way of communication. Grading defines coins in sufficient detail. It helps describe the state of preservation. We like to make it a standard common language, and we're always working towards that. Uh, it can establish a value range for sight unseen coins. And grading was developed as an alternative to get past drawings, pressings, photos, and etc. Now, I want you to imagine a time period before photography existed. And I want you to look at the coin that I have up there for you, and I want you to imagine that you are the owner of this coin. Your job is, because the coin is for sale, that you are describing the coin to someone else. The problem is, you live in California, and the person that you are describing the coin to lives in Massachusetts. Now, bear with me for a minute. Uh, we're get, just for the sake of argument, we're saying that photography doesn't exist, and the only way that you're able to get a description of the coin is by writing it down. So what I want you to do is just take a minute, make a couple notes, and try to figure in your mind how you would describe this coin to a potential buyer. So take a minute and do that. Okay, so hopefully you've had the opportunity to jot a, a few thoughts down and um, with the idea of being able to describe this coin sight unseen to a potential buyer. Well, if we had to write a definition uh, to describe this coin and its grade, it might look something like this. It's an 1870 CC Carson City, United States seated Liberty Half Dollar. An example that has been lightly circulated with a touch of wear on the coin's high points. The piece has a moderate amount of scattered marks throughout the fields on both obverse and reverse. A few minor rim bumps are visible upon close examination. Liberty is bold and complete on the shield. The centers of the stars are visible. The detail of Liberty's gown is nearly complete. The eagle's shield and feathers are complete with just a minor amount of wear along the neck and wingtips. The talons are nearly complete with just a small amount of wear. The coin has a modest amount of luster remaining accented with blue hi highlights. So suppose that you're on the receiving end of this and you take a, and you read this. It's almost too much information. 
I mean, it's a lot for you to process and a lot for you to think through. And really, uh, there's so much detail in this write-up that uh, it's still hard to envision what this coin actually is and what grade it has attained. Well, in today's world, it's a very simple matter. We would just say that it's an AU58. And if you're familiar with the series, you would know what an AU58 looks like. Well, not so much the toning, but you would know concerning the wear on the coin. And you would be able to make an informed decision as to whether you wanted to purchase the coin or not. You know, when coin collecting first took on here in the United States, there were uh, there was a lot of confusion for collectors and people who bid at auctions. Here's some terms that they may have come across. Coins a tad uncirculated, or it's good for the piece. I mean, what does that mean? Finally, this is my favorite. It was a proof, now uncirculated. Now, if you're going to get anything from me today, anything at all, I want you to get this. We're talking about the term proof. We're, tar we're talking about uh, not a grade of a coin. We're talking about its method of manufacturing. That's what a proof means. And there are a lot of people who are very experienced in the world of numismatics and don't know that. Okay, so if you're learning something today, or you're learning something that maybe a lot of more experienced collectors are not aware of, but a proof describes a method of manufacturing. So, what does that mean? It means that when a, a proof coin is created, it's generally created uh, with a highly polished planchet, struck with two highly polished dies, well, actually three dies, um, when you concern the collar, the, co the collar counts as a die. Um, so, with highly polished dies, and you're also, it's struck with extra pressure, and it's more than likely struck more than once. That's how a proof is created. Now, suppose that you have a proof. You take it out onto the road. You just let cars run over it all day long. And then when you're ready to go home, you pick up the coin and you look at it. And it's pretty bad looking. But you know what? It's still a proof. Okay? Because once a coin has been made as a proof, it will always remain so no matter how damaged or how worn it is. Now, if a proof becomes worn or damaged, at that point, we call it an impaired proof, but it's still a proof. So the idea was a proof, now uncirculated, just doesn't make, make sense. Of course, when all proofs are made, they are initially uncirculated, but if they, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are a proof. There are certainly uncirculated coins that are not proofs. Sight unseen purchases during this time period were very risky, and that's because collectors learned multiple languages. There was not any standardization towards grading. Uh, collectors had to learn how individual dealers graded their coins. And the story is that, you know, as a collector, we always see our grade as one way, but as a seller, we see the coin completely differently. Right? That's just human nature. Early attempts. The first call for standards for United States coins came in 1892. In the February issue of the Numismatist, uh, Joseph Hopper described proof and uncirculated only. He talked about extremely fine, very fine, fine, very good, good, very fair, fair, poor, and very poor. Right? That was the very first attempt. In a New York Times article in 1904 called, What Gives Old Coins Value? They said, the principal reason for a large premium on coins is its scarcity. The next thing in importance to the issue of a coin is its condition. And upon this really rests the value of a coin. You know, that, there's a lot of truth in that matter. When people ask me, um, what determines the value of a coin? I tell them that there's three variables. Number one is the mintage number. In this case, they called it scarcity. Number two is the grade of the coin. Generally, the higher the grade, the more valuable the coin. And the third reason is um, the demand for that particular coin. You know, some coins are always in high demand. 
Some coins are rarely in high demand. We call them sleepers. And then there are coins that are cyclical, coins that go up and down in value. For example, we took a look at Morgan dollars. Morgan dollars are always in high demand. If you attend a coin show, chances are that more Morgan dollars are bought and sold than any other coin, probably by a wide margin. Take a peace dollar, for example. Well, a peace dollar, the demand for peace dollars, for whatever reason, are not nearly as high as most Morgan dollars. If I took a peace dollar and a Morgan dollar, and magically they had the exact same number of mintages, and they were the exact same grade, I guarantee you that the Morgan dollar is always going to sell more for the peace dollar. Why is that? That's because the Morgan dollar is always in high demand, and the peace dollar less so. There are examples, like I said, of coins, uh, cyclical, cyclical coins that go up and down in, in value. Uh, commemorative coins are a good example of that. Buffalo nickels uh, tend to be cyclical. Mercury dimes. These are all examples of coins that go up for a while and then fall. They really, really don't know why that happens. Perhaps a uh, mercury dime was in the news and it creates a lot of interest for mercury dimes for a while. But those are examples of coins that are fairly cyclical. 1907, at the ANA Columbus Convention, Howland Wood proposed some standards, and his standards include uncirculated, very fine, fine, very good, good, fair, and poor. And this was actually published in the ANA yearbook, uh, written in 1910. Quantifying grading. The first numerical system uh, appeared in 1937, and it was proposed by Alfred Reschke. And what he did is he assigned numbers saying that uncirculated would be worth between 96 and 100 points. An excellent coin is worth between 91 and 95, superior, 86 to 90, fine, 81 to 85, good, 76 to 80, fair, 71 to 75, and poor, 66 to 70. I don't quite know why, to be perfectly honest, he started at 66. Maybe it was more of an idea that he wanted to get to the magic number of 100. Um, to me, this would be a very difficult uh, way to grade. I really don't want to have a conversation with someone about uh, a coin, whether it's a 91, 92, 3, 4, or 5, um, being labeled as excellent. I don't understand the difference between uncirculated and excellent. If we were to use the term excellent as it should be used, that means that there are no detractors and it's a perfect coin. So I don't quite understand that. But anyway, that's the, uh, those are the terms that he came up with at the time. Great inflation. You know, a lot of us think that great inflation is something that's fairly current, fairly modern. And we see that... Um, uh, the Great Inflation was first addressed way back in 1946. Uh, there were written descriptions uh, about the variables that determine the, uh, how grades can change and the value of coins. And there was a series of actual coins in various grades that uh, were sent to a central authority where they did see that there were uh, coins that were assigned different grades. For example, what used to be fine is now very fine. And when we see this in today's world, one of the reasons for great inflation concerns who owned the coin before it went up for sale. You know, if someone very famous happened to own the coin, chances are that um, there may be a lot of people interested in owning that particular coin. Not necessarily because of the grade, but because who owned it. And so that has a big role to play in great inflation. And that can happen with very, uh, very valuable coins. $1,804, for example. Major Advance in Grading. A Guide to the Grading of United States Coins, published in 1958 by Brown and Dunn. This was really the first standard work on grading all United States coins. There were written descriptions. There was a revision in 1961. Eventually, in Brown and Dunn, photos were added for each type. Um, there weren't photos uh, for specific grades. There were photos for each type of coin. Line drawings were actually added by 1964. 
in the Brown and Dunn 1969 fifth edition, there was an early attempt at degrees within a grade and coding a coin's attributes. So, for example, uh, in the book, they could list a 19 Liberty Head nickel as being an FC 1417-9R4. What does that mean? Well, it means a coin in fine condition, F, but with the obverse a normal fine and the reverse a bit more worn, C, with normal patina, 14, several die cracks, 17, and a rim neck, 9, on the reverse, R, at 4 o'clock, 4. Can you imagine having a conversation with someone saying, yeah, I grade this as an FC 14, 17, 9, R, 4. That would be a bit harder to be. And then, photo grade came out. Uh, Photographic Grading Guide for United States Coins. And this was published by James Ruddy, and where he uses photographs of coins for each grade. There were brief written descriptions and notes about uh, added to individual grades. Uh, no images of descriptions of mint state coins existed then. Uh, this was the widely accepted standard for all circulated coins. And then, uh, Ken Brissett and Abe Kossoff, in 1977, published uh, a detailed introduction and background information. They introduced standards for mint state coins, um, specific written descriptions for obverse and reverse, resurrected line drawings, photographs appeared in the 1987 with the third edition, color photographs appeared in the seventh, seventh edition, and the book that we're talking about is the ANA Grading Standards book. And I wanted to show you that, uh, and hopefully you'll get a little bit of to see what this is. Uh, I don't know if you can see this or not. I, I'll hold it here. Um, this is actually a line drawing that uh, was made by an artist that Ken Brissett, uh employed for the book. And what he actually did with the line drawings is he had an artist's rendition, and then he would erase several parts of the lines for, on the coin to show you the wear that would take place. He gave this to me at the Atlanta show uh, for safekeeping and, and to use in the class, and I, I just thought that was fascinating. Uh, so anyway, Kate, uh, Ken Brissett and Abe Kossoff got together, and they worked on the ANA standards that have been used by the American Numismatic Association over these many years. And then we have the third-party uh, grading standards. Professional Coin Grading Service, PCGS, they came up with their um, standards in 1997 and revised them in 2004. They also determined their standards for grading and counterfeit detection with detailed descriptions of grading circulated, mint state, and proof coins. Numismatic Guarantee Corporation, NGC, in 2004. Uh, they, they published their standards, focus on modern coins, post-1964, and a guide for grading uncirculated and proof coins. It's important to understand that both of these third-party grading companies uh, have morphed with their own grading standards over the years, but that they originally started with the ANA grading standards and have since changed over time. That's important to understand because a lot of people, you know, will get a coin that is graded by one of the third-party grading companies, and they're not really happy about the grade for whatever reason. And they'll send it to a third, uh, another third-party grading company, and they'll come back with a grade that is different. And they'll say, how can this be? You know, I'm dealing with professionals here. How can it be graded one way by one company and graded in another way by a second company? And the answer is that they may have different grading standards for that particular series of coins. Uh, there are some third-party grading companies that have a reputation for grading certain series of coins uh, more conservatively than others, and that's why they uh, that's why that happens. So please keep that in mind that the third-party grading companies have different standards. Sometimes the standards will dictate that they'll grade a coin completely differently than another third party. Finally, we get to the Shellman system. Um, Sheldon used early American sense, uh, sort of as his test case, 
and he realized that there was a need for systematic or, uh, ordering and that we needed to clarify those terms for communication's sake. The, uh, he decided that a coin's value rests with its condition, rarity, market history. And he said that there needs to, there, there has to be a need to correlate the value and condition. In other words, what he's trying to do is he's trying to combine the value along with the condition of the coin. And he started by tracking sales of common varieties of 1794 large cents through the second quarter of the 20th century. And he decided that he wanted to identify unutilated condition as the basal state, condition number one. What that means is that he's offering uh, condition number one to coins that are so worn that you can barely tell what they are. And he's saying that at the time that a coin that is listed as a number one in its basal state sells for 50 cents to 150, to, excuse me, a dollar and 50 cents. Coins that are listed in fair condition, which he gave the number two, bring twice as much as the basal state number one. So he's saying that fair coins sell for about two dollars, and that's why we're assigning number two to that. So he says if fair costs two dollars, good, a coin that is good, costs four dollars, fine costs twelve, and about uncirculated costs about fifty dollars. And so what he's saying here is that we're going to designate the good because it, it costs four dollars. We're going to assign the number four to that. Fine, we're going to assign the number 12 to that. And about uncirculated, we're going to assign the number 50. He's saying that cent value is determined by multiplying the basal value by a quantitative measure or condition. And we see the, uh, the mathematical equation there, where cent value equals the basal value times its condition. That's where he came up with the numbers that we use today. Now, of course, you know, you can't buy a fine large cent for $12. That's just not happening. So the idea um, is still used, even though how the numbers were assigned is really out of date. At first, the numerical system that you know, he started was not embraced. But when we got to the A and A granting standards in 1977, um, Kemper said and Abe Kossoff, they came up with about good, good, very good, fine, very fine, extremely fine, about uncirculated, and mint state. Notice that they came up with three mint state numbers. There was MS60, MS65, and MS70. Uh, today we have 11 um, descriptors for mint state, 11 numbers. But back then they decided on three. In the 1981 version, they added a few more grades. They used Mint State 63 and Mint State 67. Um, in the 1987 edition, they added AU58. They acknowledged, like I said, that there are 11 Mint State grades. They applied MS60 all the way through MS70. Um, and they established a market value uh, that goes along with the grade. There's a relationship there. So today, we see that there is a mid state MS60 through MS70. We have, when we're talking about AU grades, we're talking about 50, 53, 55, and 58. Extremely fine is uh, EF or XF 40 and 45. Very fine 20, 25, 30, 35, and so on. All the way down to a poor one. Right? And th those are the current grades that we utilize. Does that mean that there can't be such a thing as a fine 16? Well, technically, the answer is yes, there could be, but we don't recognize that grade. Um, it seems that we have plenty of grades to be able to go around. All right, this is this place where I wanted to stop for a few moments and entertain any questions that you may have before I move on to the second part of the, uh, of, of the presentation. So if you have a question that you'd like to type in to uh, Brianna, uh, please go ahead, and for the next five or ten minutes or so, I'll be happy to try and address them. Oh, Rod, if you have come in, but first, before we do that, I've gotten a bunch of questions of if this is recorded or not. This is being recorded, and we're going to put this on our website. We just don't have a date yet, so just watch for that um, so you can see this presentation at a later date. 
Also, we are going to hopefully um, do Grading 101 again in the fall time. We don't have a date for that yet, but if um, you know anybody that couldn't be in um, today's presentation that wanted to be, we're going to try and redo that again here in in, um, in the fall. So. No, that, that is true. Um, and not only that, but if there's a question that I, I don't get to for whatever reason, and but you really are looking for an answer, it's very important, you can certainly email me at gillis, G-I-L-L-I-S, at money.org. That's my work email address. And I'll do my very best to answer them as, as quickly as possible. So that that's another option for you. So, Rod, the first question that came in was, do the professional grading services use multiple graders when grading a submitted coin? Multiple graders. Um, so, first of all, uh, let's, when someone grades the coin, um, there is a, what is, is called a finalizer. And when we take, when, we, when you take our grading class, we set it up uh, in teams so that everyone takes a, a shot at being the finalizer. What I mean by that is that someone, uh, if there's a disagreement amongst the team on a particular grade, they, the finalizer, is there for making a final decision. And that happens with the grading companies. Um, the uh, person who is responsible for the initial grading will grade the coin, and then it will eventually find its way to a finalizer who will uh, take a look at the coin, and based on what the initial grader uh, had with, for the coin, they will either agree or disagree. What's important to understand is that the uh, initial grader um, does not spend a huge amount of time with the coins that they grade. Uh, as a matter of fact, a study was done, and the average time that they spend with a coin is in seconds. You know, when we start grading coins, um, we give you maybe uh, a minute and a half to two minutes to be able to grade each coin. And when people are grading for the first time, that uh, is very um, that seems to be very fast and when we get down at the end of the class they're taking about 30 seconds to be able to grade a coin they develop that fast we never try to get to the five or ten seconds that someone is actually spending at the grading company with a particular coin but we do try to lower the, 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 uh, the amount of time that you spend with a coin and the reason that we do that is because when you are grading a coin, it is possible to spend too much time with it. We always tell people that you are supposed to use your initial impression of the coin because most of the time your initial impression is going to be the most accurate. And it's possible for you to talk yourself out of the, your initial impression, therefore your accurate grade. So uh, while you don't we don't want to necessarily try to get you to be able to grade a coin, a grade a coin in three or four seconds. That's not our goal. Um, we don't want you to spend an inordinate amount of time with the coin either, because that can be harmful. Great. The next one came in. Um, will this course include any comment about banknote grading? I'm sorry about what? Banknote grading. Banknote grading. You know, uh, at summer seminar, we do have courses on uh, paper money. Uh, here in the, the grading, uh, the fundamentals of grading, which is the official name of the course that we teach during summer seminar, uh, we don't. Uh, we don't talk about um, we don't talk about uh, paper currency. We do, on occasion, spend some time with world coins because we have a theory that if you can grade United States coins uh, pretty effectively. You're pretty much able to grade any coin, and so oftentimes we've made in the uh, a part of our official grading set, we have some world coins in there just to try that theory out. We also try to have some fun doing that. Next one. What type of tools do you suggest for grading coins? USB microscopes, eye loops? Great question. So um, when people are, uh, when we talk about things that are required to uh, be able to grade coins, we generally ask them to use a loop uh, between five and seven power. Anything above that is really too strong. You know, this, the higher that you go in loop magnification, the more distorted the coin is actually going to be. And so we suggest using five or seven for just regular grading. Um, we also suggest that you use a, um, a regular light bulb, um, 60 or 70 uh, watts, uh, incandescent light bulb. 
And uh, we also tell you that there's a proper way to hold the loop when you're looking at the coin. You know, so many people take the coin and then they'll take their loop and they'll kind of adjust it to the, uh, until it comes into focus. We tell people that you want to hold the loop fairly close to your eye and then you want to adjust the coin um, so that it eventually comes into focus. We also tell people, and this is extremely important, I'm so glad that you brought this up, is that when you're looking at a coin initially, we tell people that you are to eyeball it. In other words, you're not to use the loop initially to look at the coin. We say that once you've eyeballed the coin and you've formed an initial impression, it's at that point that you're going to use your loop and use your loop to verify your initial impression. Either it's going to be correct or wrong based on the loop, but you only do that at the very end. You're eyeballing the coin first to get that initial impression, and that's extremely important for people to learn. So many people in immediately go to the loop before they look at a coin accurately uh, by eyeballing it, and, and that's not something that you want to get into the habit of doing. We had about 40 questions come in, so you'll have to decide. Well, well, let's take, um, we'll take uh, two more. Okay. Um, why is PCDS considered superior to NGC? So there really isn't, uh, you know, it, it really depends on uh, who, which grading company that you prefer. I would say that there is a, um, there is a pecking order um, with grading companies. I would say that um, for most people, and, and, I, and I'm not necessarily agreeing with this, I'm just saying this is the kind of way it is, is that PCGS and NGC are sort of listed as the top tier uh, grading companies. And then um, in a uh, secondary tier would be companies like ANAX um, and ICG. And then you can work your way down to Fred's grading service, I suppose. You know, and, and it's important to understand that a company that would be in a second tier, let's use ANAX for example, it doesn't mean that their graders are inferior, um, not at all. It just means that for whatever reason, for whatever reason, that um, PCGS and NGC are the go-to third-party grading companies that um, most dealers recognize. So, you know, um, what I'm trying to suggest is that uh, certainly NGC and PCGS uh, there are a lot of people who only use those companies exclusive of all others. But if you have coins that are graded by ICG or, a or ANAX, um, that doesn't mean that there's a problem there. Um, and, and that's basically how it works. Great. So last question before we move on. Can you, excuse me, can you explain why some TPGs use plus grades in describing coins? Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> The idea behind plus added to grades is supposed to say, well, the coin um, is better than the average standard that we assign this grade for. And um, therefore, we're going to add this plus because it's extra special. Now, there are some people who will tell you, well, if you're going to go to that trouble and adding a plus, you probably should just move it up to the next grade. Um, and I don't necessarily disagree with that, um, but but that's that's the purpose um, behind that. We're going to spend a little bit more time talking about third-party grading companies in the second part of our presentation. And um, you know, I'm going to say some things that um, some people may find. Um, I'm not, I don't want to use the word objectionable, controversial. Um, and, and you know, my point is this that I'm not here to put the bad name out on any of the grading companies. I, I truly believe that they perform a valuable service. Um, they're, they're not bad people or anything like that. But um, I think there's, there's a few things that you need to be aware of when you're dealing with grading companies um, so that you can be an educated um, consumer. That's what I want to say. Um, I have a, we can take one more if you'd like, Brianna. Okay. Um, for a beginner, young numismatist, which grading guide would you recommend? Ah, so, great, great question. You guys are coming up with really good questions. This is, this is good stuff. So, um, when you, if you were to take the class with us, the live class, 
Uh, one of the things that you would get as part of the grading class is you would get an ANA grading standards book. Now, uh, I use the ANA grading standards. Um, that's what I'm most familiar with. Uh, are they different from PCGS and NGC? Yes, they are. Wasn't always that way, but they certainly are now. Uh, am I saying that necessarily PCGS and NGC are wrong? No, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is um, I am most familiar with the ANA grading standards. They've served me well. Uh, I, I use the book. And, you know, that's the other thing. When we teach the class, because everyone gets a copy of the ANA grading standards, there's uh, some people are reluctant to use it. It's like, well, if I use the ANA grading standards book, then I'm kind of cheating. And, and that's, that's so wrong. So far from it. Um, you know, one of the things that we're, I'm going to harp on is that you really need to know your series when you're grading a coin effectively. And you're going to run across some coins that you're just not familiar with. And the ANA grading standards comes as a great book to help you do that. For example, um, how many times do I uh, how many times do I run across a trine? You know, a silver three three cent piece. Rarely happens. Do I remember the specific um, grades for each uh, condition for a trine? No, I don't because I rarely run into it. So I pop out the ANA grading standards book. And, and I have the uh, I, I have the grades right there, and then I can use them. So um, that's a great question, and I'm fir a firm believer that a great book that uh, everyone should have if they collect United States coins is the ANA Grading Standards book. All right. Okay. Let's. Uh, great questions, by the way. You guys did a tremendous job, and I look forward to answering some more a little bit later. Oh, sorry. Give me one moment. Uh, Rod, hit the other side of your cursor. I think you're on the right cursor. Okay, let's try now. I think I'm going the wrong way. Hold on one second. There we go. Pardon me for a second. Sorry. So when we're talking about grading, there are basically two types of grading. There is technical grading and market grading. Let's spend a few moments talking about each. Technical grading. Technical grading is the scientific part of actual grading. So when, when we reserve technical grading mostly for coins that have been circulated. So what we tell people is that when you're encountering a coin initially, the very first thing that we want you to do is we want you to determine whether the coin has been circulated or is mint state. And if it is mint state or, or is not mint state, um, what's the level of wear? And if the level of wear is XF, 45 or below, we like to tell people that you are to employ technical grading. There is so many letters showing on Lady Liberty, therefore it's this grade. That's how we do that. Market grading is completely different. Market grading we uh, teach is basically reserved for coins that are in the um, AU territory, about uncirculated, all the way up through mid-state. Now, I'm going to say something a little bit controversial here, um, but this is not just me. Um, if you talk to Bill Fieva, who has been around collecting for a very long time, Bill would tell you, that market grading, uh, that the third-party grading companies really do not grade coins, they value them. In other words, they'll see it, they'll encounter a coin, and they'll say, well, this particular coin on the market would probably sell for this much money. Therefore, the grade is, is this. Um, that's basically how that works. And uh, if, if you have a chance to talk with Bill, 
um, he would tell you that that's what he believes that market grading is about. Technical grading describes a state of preservation. Um, this is again, this is more science than art. It's relative to the piece that is struck. So, in other words, you're not comparing the coin to a perfect example. Um, with technical grading, there's a difference between mm -hmm. circulated coins versus mint state coins. Again, when we're putting uh, circulated coins in front of you, we're saying that um, th you're to see where the wear is located, how much wear it is, and th it therefore is that grade. It's not affected by the marketplace. Uh, we're not concerned how valuable the coin is at that moment. We're just com concerned about getting an accurate grade. It's considered the true grading of a coin. That's what technical grading is all about. Market grading. Market grading really um, is made up of four points. It describes the state of preservation with modifiers. And those four modifiers are marks, strike, luster, and eye appeal. And when I was teaching with Bill Fever uh, the last time, he said something that I learned from, and it just made perfect sense. He said that marks plus strike plus luster equals eye appeal. And that's a perfect way to say that. Um, because eye appeal it sounds so subjective, but that's how you get to eye appeal, by adding the marks, strike, and luster. And by talking about marks, we're uh, talking about um, marks that happen at the mint. Um, and not only are we talking about the severity of the marks, but we're also talking about their location. Strike, we're talking about strength of strike. You know, there are coins that uh, strike up very well, have a strong strike. And generally, they have a higher grade. There are also coins that are weakly struck. For example, um, Liberty Head Nickels during, uh, excuse me, Liberty, uh, Liberty Walking Half Dollars that were manufactured during the Second World War have a habit of have being very weakly struck. And that does affect the final grade uh, in market grading. Not in technical grading, but in market grading it does. So for example, if you have a, a weakly struck coin, very rarely will it be graded higher than an MS-64. Of the four items that we have here, marks, strike, luster, and eye appeal, the most important one, by far, is luster. Luster is the most important. Without strong luster, a coin will not grade highly. Okay. Um, we're talking about market grading. It really does reflect reflect the true pricing of a coin, and therefore, because prices change, so can grades. Market variables. Um, can an AU coin still be graded MS? Yeah, it can happen, especially if the coin is very valuable. I've seen it. Um, there's always the idea of friction versus wear. You know, a long time ago, the coins were kept in coin cabinets, and because people slid the coins, that would eventually cause a little bit of friction. Is that the same as the wear? Is that the same as wear? Well, again, it's all a matter of degrees. If there's extremely light friction, no, it really isn't considered wear. Large diameter coins are allowed more friction, generally because there's more surface area. Um, softer metal coins are allowed more friction. If we look at the uh, relative softness of coins, nickel is the hardest of the basic metals that are used in minting coins, a very hard metal. So the idea is for a nickel coin to pick up a mark or show where it takes a lot more effort for that to happen because it's such a hard coin. Next uh, in, in uh, softness, uh, next to the hardest nickel is copper. And then we move to silver and finally of all the metals that are used basically in making coins, gold is the softest. And that's the reason why you could still have an AU gold coin in an, in, in an MS holder. Not only because the coin is so soft, and so they give it a little bit more allowance, but because gold coins tend to be very valuable. Those are the reasons that you'll see a, a gold coin um, in, in an MS holder, although you'd swear that you see, and you're probably right, you'd swear that you'll see some, uh, some wear on the particular coin. Older types of coins are also allowed more friction. 
And that is because the Mint um, could have used machines that were so antiquated to today's standards that it was very hard to fully strike up coins. And so older type coins are allowed more friction. Certainly open collar coins are allowed more friction. Remember, when we talk about sides to a coin, there are three sides to a coin. There's the obverse and the reverse. And there's also the edge. And the edge is um, uh, the collar is definitely a die. Right? Um, generally, generally, and there are exceptions, but generally, we call the obverse uh, grade, uh, that, that's the one that uh, predominates. Uh, usually, the obverse is what is called the money side. Now, there are examples where that's not true, but for the vast majority of coins, the obverse is the money side. How to examine a coin? Well, it's a learned skill. Uh, and with that, consistently, consistency is the key. You definitely want to have clean hands. You don't want to eat or drink while you're examining coins. You want to be comfortable you want to use the best equipment that you can, and the best equipment is not necessarily expensive. More than anything, you need to know your series. You need to know what it is that you are looking for to be able to grade a coin effectively. We talked earlier about the loop. Uh, again, you want to find a loop. Um, we recommend a Hastings triplet loop. We talk about a Hastings triplet loop. We're not talking about three lenses, uh, three different lenses for you to use. Actually, all three lenses are built into one, and, and the idea behind that is to um, make sure that there's not a lot of distortion. So um, a Hastings triplet uh, between 5 and 7 power is definitely the way to go. Right? Again, you want to use incandescent lighting. You know, there are several different types of lighting. Uh, incandescent, there's uh, sunlight, um, a whole lot of different. And we find that uh, incandescent light seems to be the best way in which to be able to grade your coin. You want to be careful not to drop the coin. Be alert. Um, get as clear of you as possible. If it is in a slab, you want to be aware if there's any damage on the holder. A lot of times a slab has been around for quite some time and through no fault of its own, it, uh, there may be a section where there's some scratches or some rubbing and you want to be aware of that so that you don't attribute the damage that's on a holder to the actual coin itself. Um, when you're looking at a coin, for example, at a coin show, and it's in a uh, flip, um, you only want to remove the coin with the permission of the owner. Okay? Please don't talk over a coin. Talk about your coin a lot, but don't talk over it. And there's a, a, a bit of philosophy with this. I believe that we are all numismatic stewards, and we never really own coins. We're only fortunate enough to take care of them for a little while. While you're owning your, and while you are being a numismatic steward and taking care of a coin, your job is to enjoy it, but also make sure that nothing happens to it, so that when it moves on to the next collector, that it's in the best possible condition that it can be. The right tools. Again, we talked about sunlight, fluorescent light, halogen, incandescent. The problem that we have with halogen and fluorescent lights is they generally um, put the coin in a bad position where you're going to grade it too harshly. Um, it, it shows up its defects um, too easy. Sunlight is just a strange light altogether. Uh, let me give you an example of what I mean. One of the uh, things that we do for youngsters at our shows is we have something called Treasure Trivia, where they receive a question sheet, and then they go around to pre-selected dealers and ask them numismatic questions, and then they return back to us with the answers, and we check them over and give them prizes. We, with the question sheet, we try to use a color on the question sheet that has something to do with the particular city that we're in. And... Um, we were in Denver, and because uh, of the football team in Denver, we used orange for the sheets. And uh, when we uh, looked at them in the, on the board's floor, they were indeed orange. 
for some reason, I stuck one in my pocket at the end of the first day of the show, and I was heading out uh, side, and I uh, looked at the sheet that was orange in the sunlight, and I swear to you, it looked goldenrod. Uh, it didn't look anything like the orange as it did on the board's floor. And that really scared me. So <clears throat> if sunlight can do that, can actually change the color of a piece of paper, imagine what it can do with looking at the coin. And so most dealers, when you're at a coin show, will have an incandescent light available for you to access when you're looking at the coin. Please make sure that you do that. Okay. Again, uh, magnification, we talked about uh, Hastings Triplet Loop. Uh, that's the best way to go. There are many companies who make Hastings Triplet Loop, um, so that you should be able to find them without uh, too much difficulty. Again, we suggest that you use between 5 and 7 power. Higher power, 10 to 20, is good if you're looking for varieties and errors. That is the, that is the loop that you want to use at that point. But when you're just learning how to grade, or when you're just grading in general, you don't want to use anything higher than a 7 power. Um, please make sure as a safety net, you may want to have a padded velvet tray and with a towel around you. All these things are good tools to have when you're learning how to grade. And I'm always reminded what Kemper said, uh, said um, learning how to grade is easy. All you need is the proper tools, the proper light, and about 20 years of experience. Viewing a coin. Please make sure that if you're holding a raw coin, you're holding it by its edge. You want to place the coin between 8 and 12 inches under your light source and view the coin without magnification. Look at the obverse, reverse edge. You want to look at the focal points, and we'll describe what focal points are in, in a few minutes. Most importantly, if you've determined that the coin is mint state or AU, you want to rotate and rock the coin to view light reflection. And we call this light reflection, um, the, what we call that is luster. And then you're to, inform, you're to um, form your initial impression of the coin. And your initial impression is critical because that usually is the correct answer. And only after you have put in your initial impression are you therefore ready to go to the loop. Don't go to the loop immediately. Eyeball it first. Like I said, if necessary, view under magnification. Make sure that you hold the magnifier and the coin correctly. Um, you're, you're to look at the fields, the devices, the rim and edge. Some people like to divide the coin up into quadrants, into four sections, as they're looking for it. I really don't have any strong feelings about that either way. If that's something that helps you, then by all means do that. Uh, it's not something that we say that you have to do. I personally don't do that. But again, I'm not saying it's wrong. Uh, use whatever it is available to help you. The other reason that you want to change the angle, you might want to change the angle of lighting to reveal any scratches that you're looking for. Um, you're using the loop to confirm or refute your initial impressions. That's what the loop is there, to find something that you may have missed when you were originally eyeballing it. Parts of a coin. So we have the edge, we have the rim, we have the field, and devices. You'll notice that I have two errors for devices, because on some coins, there are what we call uh, primary and secondary devices. There are also tertiary devices, and, and there can be more, depending on how busy the coin is. Field. We determine the field as any area that does not contain a design, plain area. Um, the edge, we self talked about the edge being the third side of a coin, and there are several edges. There are plain edge coins, there are reeded edge coins, and there are lettered edge coins. Those are the basic three edges that you'll encounter. And then there are rims. Rims are around for two reasons on a coin. Number one is they help make the coin stackable with other coins. And number two, they also provide sort of a basic protection for the device, which is usually found in the center of the coin. So in theory, the rim should be one of the highest points, if not the highest point, on a coin. When you're looking at a coin, the attributes are slightly circulated or mint state coins. That's market grading. Um, you're looking at marks that you can find on the surface. 
you're looking at the strike quality and the fullness. Again, the um, strength of strike is important. You're looking at mint luster, and you're looking at eye appeal. And once again, all three, strike quality, luster, and the marks, their location and severity, all is what makes up eye appeal. Marks. Let's talk about each of the detractors. So there are several types of marks that um, can be had on a coin. Bag marks is a misnomer. Um, usually when we're talking about bag marks, uh, especially when we're talking about coins with a reeded edge, you're going to see a hit on the coin, and it's really divided up into small sections where the reading is. And I'm here to tell you that that very rarely happens once a coin is inside the bag. More than likely, those bag marks are created just after the coin has been minted. And here are two reasons why. Number one is, when the coins are minted because of friction, they generally are very worn to the touch. And because they're worn, that means the metal is malleable. And once a coin has been ejected and is sitting there in the bin, which we call a Gaylord, when another coin is ejected and hits that initial coin with its edge, that's what's going to leave what we call a bag mark. Okay? So um, bag marks are usually, uh, usually occur right after the coin has been minted, not after it has been put in the bag. So one type is bag marks, roll marks, marks that can be had once the coin has been placed in a roll, or just general friction marks as the coin is being um, manufactured. These are things that happen at the source or happen at the mint. Owner inflicted marks include hairlines, album slide marks, or flip marks. All of these marks are located in the, um, by, the, by the owner of the coin. Um, when we're talking about technical grading, bag marks, roll marks, friction marks, they're really not to be considered. Um, in market grading, it's completely different. Location of these detractors is paramount. When we call it a location, we talk about focal points. So here we have a $10 gold coin. My question to you is, what would be the focal points? And you might be asking me, well, before I answer that, what are focal points? Focal points are areas that your eyes are attracted to first due to the design. And chances are, when you're looking at focal points, you're also looking at the highest areas, the areas in most relief of the design on the coin. Okay? So when we're looking at this $10 uh, gold piece, if we are to locate the focal points, here they are. These are the areas that encounter initial wear, and that's why we call them focal points. And it's also the area that your eyes tend to uh, be attracted to because of the design. Here's a two cent piece. What are the focal points of a two cent piece? Well, here they are. It's the date, it's the lines uh, in the badge, and on the reverse, it's the area right where it indicates two cents. And you might be saying, well, a lot of the focal points seem to be in the center of the coin, and you would be right. Um, because just the way we hold coins, we often hold coins in the center uh, before we're spending them or as we're getting ready to spend them. And so that's often the place of initial wear. Let's now talk about surface marks. You know, the severity of surface marks is not the only consideration. Their location is also very important, too. So when we're looking at this coin, for example, there are some very slight marks. They're generally located in the field. That's not too bad. And so in... in my estimation is this coin would probably grade very well because the marks are not very severe and they're in places that are not very obvious. Let's take further looks. And if you look at this coin carefully, you're going to see that there is a bag mark. that was it, The coin was hit by the edge of another coin, a reeded edge. And you'll see that it's uh, about 7 o'clock on the coin, right above the two stars. It's not a very severe mark. It's not very deep or long. And it's in an area that is not extremely noticeable. Let's take a look at this coin. 
This is the coin that has a bag mark that's right on the cheek. And I mean, when you look at the coin, your eye just goes right there. So what I'm suggesting to you is that this coin would not grade nearly as well as the original one we looked at, not only because of the severity, but because of the location of the mark or detractor. Again, this is in another obvious area, right along the chin. Maybe not so much as the cheek, but uh, certainly in a pretty obvious area. So um, the, the, the graders would hold back on this coin just for that reason. Now this one is on the neck. Um, not quite as obvious as the previous two. Perhaps a little more, more obvious than the initial one. Um, but uh, that's a location. So again, the reason that I show these to you is I want to, you to remember that not only the severity of the scratch or mark is important, but where it's located is, is equally important. So if we looked at all four coins together, we would say, hopefully you would say, that the lower right coin, the mark is the least invasive. The next up would be the upper left coin, where the mark is on the neck. Um, more invasive would be the upper right, where you'll see that hit on the chin. And the most evasive would be the lower left, where it's right on the cheekbone, almost in the center of the coin. Where would we find friction on a St. Gaudens $20 gold piece? Well, the answer is here. We find on the obverse, uh, uh, the initial focal points are her knee and her breast. And if we look on the reverse of the coin, we see the eagle's breast and also the top uh, portion of the wings. Those are the areas that are focal points. So if you're looking for wear on a coin on a $20 gold piece, these are the areas that your eyes should be attracted to first to discern if there's any wear. And by the way, um, when we're talking about wear, how do you determine if it's wear and not a weak strike? Well, one of the most important determiners is a change of color. When you see a coin and you see a change of color in the coin, that's a really good indication that in that area, that coin has suffered some wear. Change of color is very important. Sometimes it can be lighter, sometimes it can be darker, depending on what the coin is and what it has gone through. Friction on silver. If you remember, we talked about how silver is slightly more, uh, is, is slightly harder than gold, and therefore graders uh, don't allow quite the leeway with silver coins as they would with uh, gold coins. When we're looking at the Morgan dollar, for example, the focal points that we're taking a look at are the, um, the cheek primarily. We're also taking a look at the hairline. And on the reverse, we're taking a look at the eagle's breast. <clears throat> and we're also taking a look at the wingtips, especially the wingtips on our left-hand side. Okay, luster. Real important here. I'm going to spend some time talking about it. Luster is very important for mint state through AU coins. Sometimes luster can be present all the way down to very fine pieces, but rarely. There are various luster types, and the, lust, the various luster types depends on the, the dye preparation, and it varies with dye use. Luster, here we go, real important. Luster is created by metal flow. That's it. Luster cannot be created any other way. That's real important for you to understand. There are several types of luster based on the design of the coin and based on the life of the die. For example, when dies are brand new, the type of luster that we assign to that is often called proof light. I'm not a real big fan of that term. I know what it is that they mean. But the reason I'm not a big fan of that term is because we're getting into that proof grade kind of gray area that I don't like. But anyway, we're talking about proof like we're talking about brand new dyes and the incredible amount of uh, reflectivity that is created with the, the, the brand new dyes. <clears throat> when the dyes uh, experience a little bit of wear, very slight, they are the amount of luster is called semi-proof like. 
after the dyes are, are uh, been used for quite some time, it's a frosty appearance. Then we get into a satin appearance. And then when the dyes are very worn, the, there will hardly be any luster at all. And we call that flat. Again, luster is created by metal flow. That's it. Luster, once it is lost, can never be recreated. So when people dip coins in the hope that their lu the luster will come back, that's a fallacy. It, it, it can't come back because it's only created while the coin is being made. So in this instance, what you're seeing are, are arrows that are shooting out from the center of the coin. And uh, what is happening is when all the pressure is created on the planchet from the dies, that pressure is so great that instantaneously metal wants to escape. And so it shoots out. Almost as quickly, once pressure is released from the dies on the planchet, the metal comes back in. And that flowing out and coming back in is what causes luster. Here I have a picture of a Lincoln scent under high magnification. And hopefully you can see what I see, which are these mountaintops, peaks and valleys. And the peaks and valleys are what is, creates the, ref, the reflectivity that we call luster. So as you tilt the coin, the, um, the light hits these peaks and valleys at different angles, and that is what causes the luster to be apparent. As coins are handled in circulation, just by the simple act of rubbing your finger, um, the plateaus, the peaks, begin to wear. Also, when you put, place coins in some sort of solvent, the peaks begin to wear. Okay? That's why when people uh, dip a coin too many times, they're going to get a flat, washed out appearance. Because what has happened is they've reduced the, the peaks and they're flat now. And, and that's what creates it. So once again, I can't say this enough, luster is only created at the mint. And once luster is lost, it can never, ever be brought back. Here's an example of a coin that has suffered through dye erosion. And what we mean by that is that the, um, the dyes are very worn at this point. Uh, in this particular example, not only are the dyes worn, but the dyes have been clashed. I'll show you what I mean in just a moment. But how do we know the dyes have been worn? Well, if you look on the left-hand side and you see the stars, notice how that one piece of star uh, in every star is sort of gravitating towards the edge of the coin, towards the rim. Um, that's a sure sign that the dye is worn. On the right-hand side, you'll see that there has, some clashing has take, taken place. There's been a point where there was no planchet between the two dies, and the obverse die picked up some of the, uh, the design of the reverse die, and then from that point on, that's going to be included in all the subsequent coins. And that's why you see <coughs> excuse me, a clash die. Why would they do this? Well, especially during the early days, um, up through, I would say, in the 1920s, early 30s, that the mint just used dyes until you couldn't use them anymore, until they fell apart. That's why if you look at coins from the 1920s, uh, Lincoln cents, there are some that the dyes were so worn that you would swear that you're looking at a highly circulated coin, or actually you're looking one that the detail has been so gone that you're looking at something mint state. Here's an example of proof like luster. Uh, again, you know, luster can really not be represented from an image. So this hopefully gives you an, a, a basic idea of the proof like. You'll notice that behind the bonnet of Lady Liberty, there's this mirror-like reflectivity. And that's what, cre that's what is created when we talk about proof like luster. Here's a frosty coin. Um, if you look at, um, well, I'd say, 4 and 5 o'clock on the obverse of the coin, and then again at 10 and 11, you'll see that area is a little darker. That's what we mean. That's the cartwheel effect as you're tilting the coin. Uh, you're going to see the luster follow along as you tilt it. That's, and that's a frosty, frosty coin. 
this is a uh, this die has a very minor amount of wear and uh, still creates a, a great deal of luster and that's showed up in the coin. Satin luster. The satin luster is uh, completely different from frosty luster and there are a lot of coins when they're fully lustrous that's the type of luster that they exhibit and a, a great example of that is the peace dollar. Why is that? And that is because the design is very low in relief. Generally when you have very low relief coins they, the type of luster that appears is a satin luster. And uh, the, uh, the peace dollars are great examples of that. Strike quality. Strike quality is important for mint state through AU grades. Once you get into uh, the lower grades, strike quality really isn't all that important. Factors that affect strike quality, striking pressure, die spacing, dies that are unparalleled, worn or eroded dies. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, striking pressure. There were, during the history of some mints that were way out in the boondocks, getting a steady supply of dies was very difficult. New Orleans is a great example of that. Delanida is another great example. And so the, uh, the guys who worked at those mints realize that if they lessened up on the pressure for the dies when they're minting coins that the dies would last longer and so what they decided to do was to lessen up on the pressure now what does that what happens well that affects the luster of the coins and it also can affect the detail of the coins and we call that a weak strike die spacing you know uh, when the uh, dies are uh, placed ready to mint coins they, uh, the, the distance between the two dies has to be uniform. And if not, then that will affect the design or the luster on a particular coin, the detail. The dies themselves have to be parallel. If one is crooked and one is leaning further down than the other, what's going to happen is that that area that's leaning down will strike up higher or harder than the area that is not. That'll be a weak strike. That'll localize weak strike. That's what we mean by that. So it's very important when the um, minting machines are set up, the minting presses, that the dies are parallel. Otherwise, you're going to have this localized weak strike. And then, again, there are examples of worn or eroded dies where fully struck coins can appear weakly struck. And again, uh, we talk about the, the sense from the 1920s. That's a great example. So here's a coin with a weak strike. If you look at the reverse, you'll see if you look at the mint mark, it's an O. That is New Orleans. And so New Orleans are typical weak strikes for the reasons that I explained. How can you tell? Well, if you look at the eagle's breast on the reverse, you can see that there's hardly any detail there. Right? If we could look at this coin in our hands, you would see that there's no change in color. There might be a little bit of change in luster, but not in color. And so therefore, there's no wear there. If you look at the obverse, look at her hairline, especially above the ear, and look at the ear itself. You'll see that the ear itself is sort of flattened out there. This is a typical example of a uh, weakly struck mid-state Morgan dollar. And again, this is the reason that I tell you, uh, you need to know your series. So if you know your series and you're collecting Morgan dollars, you know that if it's a New Orleans uh, coin, that there's a good possibility that it suffers from a weak strike. And if you do encounter a New Orleans coin, but it is fully struck to a strong strike, you know now that you really have something. You probably want to get that coin. And that's why knowing a series is so very important. You look at Buffalo Nichols. You know, Buffalo Nichols are, again, because they're made of nickel, they're extremely... It's a hard metal, and it's hard for them to strike up fully. If you look at the obverse of the buffalo nickel, you can see that where the hair is, that there's a real loss of detail right there. And that's not where there's no change of color. Um, that's uh, just weak, a weak strike. And if you look at the buffalo at the top, you'll see that there is also a, a, a loss of detail. And again, that's not attributed to... Um, where that's attributed to weak strike. And I, I'll let you in on a little 
on a side note that when you're learning how to grade, just learning how to grade, sometimes it's very difficult to tell the difference between a weak strike and a coin that has some wear to it. Uh, again, the tip is that you are going to look for a change of color. But the other tip is you're just going to have to encounter a lot of coins, and you're just going to have to learn from it. Uh, it's not easy. A lot of our new students struggle with the um, fact that they have a difficult time learning the difference between um, a weak strike and, and where. Here's an example of a well-struck buffalo nickel. And can you see the indent there, the detail that is present? as opposed to the other coin. Let me go back to the other coin for a minute. See the indent there and, and how much detail shows as opposed to this one? Can you see the difference? Okay, That's the difference between one that is very well struck and one that is weakly struck. Okay. Full strike designations. There are certain coins that we call full struck coins. That doesn't mean that if it's not fully struck, that it is worn. No, you can have a coin that is uh, not fully struck, but still be mid-state, okay? When we're looking at full strike designations, we're looking at full split bands on Mercury Dimes. We're looking at full bell lines on Franklin Halves. We're looking at full head on Standing Liberty Quarters, full steps on Jefferson Nichols, and a full torch on Roosevelt Dimes. Here are the full bands on a... Uh, Mercury dime. So you see the bands in the center of the fossies, and they are separated, okay? And that is what's considered full bands. Um, the bands should be split. In other words, if you see, uh, I, I like to tell people, if you can see where the bands are split, think of that as a river. And your job is to sail a boat across the coin, across the river. And if there are any blockages at all, then those are not split bands. Okay. Some of you might be saying, well, do we have to check all three because there are bands at the bottom of the fossies and there are bands at the top as well as the center? And the answer is no. If the uh, bands are full bands, full split bands in the center, uh, I can guarantee you that the ones at the top and the bottom will be as well. Full bell lines. Uh, full bell lines on Franklin halves. There was a time when full bell lines indicate were indicated by lines at the upper um, deal with this for a moment the upper bottom portion of the bell and the very bottom of the bell that they both needed to be full that has changed um, some of the grading companies allow the um, only the bottom um, to be fully struck to be labeled full bell lines full head so this is the standing liberty quarter and there have to be several things to happen for uh, a full head Number one, that there has to be a full hairline. There is also the um, hair band um, that Lady Liberty is wearing. And there is also a ear hole that needs to be there. And so if those things aren't there, they are not considered, uh, it's not considered to be a, a fully struck coin. Full steps. So with the Jefferson Nickel reverse, there has to be a definition between all the steps, and, there, and the uh, end of the columns have to be defined as well. Um, as a matter of fact, years ago, there was a full step nickel club. Tell me they don't have too much time on their hands. Um, but these people, uh, they looked for fully, uh, the, the uh, fully struck up steps that were separated, and the columns as well. And then we have the full torch for the Roosevelt Dimes. Okay, again, the bands, sort of like on Mercury Dimes. Okay, now we get to eye appeal. Um, eye appeal, again, it is the culmination of the other three things that we talked about, strength of strike, um, marks, and uh, uh, the uh, amount of luster. Um, eye appeal can follow market trends. I'll spend a moment talking about that. Uh, but before we do that, let us open up the floor for questions.
Okay, Brad, so I think I'm just going to go back to where we left off since a whole bunch of questions come in. I know we'll be, we'll be able to get to all of them. I'll try my best. The last one here. Give me just one second. Sorry about that. You guys have sent in a lot of great questions, so there's a lot we'll have to get through. So the next question that came in, um, why are mint state grades only assigned to Morgan and Peace dollars instead of all coins in the 1977 version of the standards? Um, you know, I don't have a copy of the 1977 version in front of me, um, but, I, but what I can tell you is that in, in grading, um, mint state coins, of course, are any coin can be mint state. Um, I don't happen to have a copy with me, so I'd have to take a look at that. Um, and and actually, what I can do is uh, I happen to be good friends with Ken Ken Brissett, who was one of the writers. So maybe I can consult him in talking about that as well. Uh, if that is a question that um, you're willing to send to me um, when I have the book in front of me, I'll be happy to find the answer to that. All right. Um, so why do we limit our grading numbers? Good question. Um, and there are two sides to that. There are two sort of camps. There are people who um, want us to expand the um, grading numbers from, let's say, one all the way up to 100. And then there are others that um, like to keep it as it is. I personally, and this is just me, I personally am very happy with the current set of numbers that we have. Um, I really don't have a, want to have a discussion with somebody as to whether a coin is a 98 or 99. I have enough trouble um, differentiating a 70 as opposed to a 69. So um, I, th I think that, that that is the reason. That doesn't mean that it will always remain as it is now. Um, that there's a possibility that it may change. But personally, um, I'm in favor of that. Now, um, but you bring up a good point. And Bill Fieba did a wonderful uh, article that he wrote called that there's good in every grade. And what he means by that? is if you bought a bag of Morgan dollars, you could do this. You bought a bag of 100 Morgan dollars from the bank. You bring them home, and you open up the bag, and you spread them out all over your kitchen table. What you're going to find is that you're going to find examples of coins that are going to be 60s. You're going to put some in a category that are 61, 62s, and following. You're probably going to not find anything above a 65, but you may. But the vast majority of your coins are going to fall somewhere between 60s and 64s. What he's saying is that you're going to find three examples in each grade. So in other words, let's use 63s. You're going to find a coin that just makes it as a 63. Just makes it. You're going to find a 63 that is a poster child of what a 63 should look like. And then you're going to find a coin that's a 63 and based on maybe just one detractor, it's, it's only one detractor away from being a 64. So what he says is there's good in each grade, that within each grade, within a 61, within a 62, you're basically going to find three grades within that major grade. I don't know about you, but if you think of it that way, um, boy, that's more than enough grades for me to have to worry about. Great question. Are there changes in the grading standards between versions of the ANA grading text? Okay, I'm sorry, can you run that by me one more time? Are there changes in the grading standards between versions of the ANA grading text? You, the grading tests? Text, like the book. Oh, um, there are always, not lately, not lately. Again, the, the, biggest, the biggest difference in the um, seventh version of the ANA grading standards as opposed to the previous version was that they changed the images from black and white over to color. Has there been any changes in the, in the book over the course of time? Sure. And mostly the changes have occurred in the um, number of grades that have been offered. And if you think about that, what that means is, as more grades have been offered over the course of time, that affects any one particular grade. So, for example, if let's say that we had um, 
there was a point where the mint state only had three examples. Let's say the examples were 60, 64, and 70. Well, now you have a, a 62, uh, which is in between the 60 and 64. So is that going to affect the 60 and 64 grade? Probably, because you have more grades to choose from. Great, great question. But we'll take, uh, we'll take one more. Okay, I'll actually give you two. I'm going to answer one really quick. A question came in about if there's going to be an advanced grading class. I can answer that. And we, um, it depends on um, if we can find an instructor to teach it, as well as if they think what they can teach can be put on a PowerPoint. A lot of our summer seminar classes are hands-on, so the work that's been put into these is a lot of work to go from hands-on to a PowerPoint. Um, so the person that asked about advanced grading or if any of you had that question, we don't know yet, but we will. And if we do get somebody or the ability to, then we will put that out there. Um, last question for you, Rod. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Um, is it true that a reverse coin, excuse me, is it true that a reverse can never improve the grade of a coin, but it can reduce the grade of a coin? Is it true? The what of a coin? I'm sorry. The reverse can never oh, improve yeah, the grade. Great question. Of a coin. Okay. Thank you. That's a great question. And we have a saying when the obverse is the money side, okay, let's let's just use that as an example. So we're gonna say let's use a Morgan dollar because the obverse is the money side. The saying that we have, and and I believe that you, you could probably find an instance where this is not the case, but I really, in most cases, what I'm going to say is absolutely true, that the reverse, the non-money side, can only hurt, but never help, the grade. Let me say that again. The non-money side, in most cases the reverse, can only hurt the final grade and never help. And that's a little sad because for a lot of coins, for whatever reason, you'll find that there are plenty of examples when the reverse actually looks a little better than the obverse. And I know that there are people out there who do what is called net grading, where they'll say, okay, the reverse is a uh, 64, but the, uh, the obverse is a 62, and therefore we're going to call it a 63. I understand the logic. I really do. But um, when we look at coins, the reverse can be a 64 or 63, and the obverse is going to is graded as a 62. And guess what the coin's going to come out as? It's going to come out as a 62. So that's a great question, and that's the answer that I have. Don't forget that, um, and we should have a few minutes of time. I'll be happy to answer uh, some questions at the very end as well. Okay? All right. Great, great questions. That, that shows me that you're paying attention. I love it. Okay, so I wanted to stop here because uh, this is an exercise in eye appeal. I want you to take a look at this coin. This is a 20 cent piece, a double dime, Carson City, and uh, 1875, nice coin. And, uh, and look at it carefully, okay? Form an opinion on it. And in terms of opinion, not necessarily the grade, but form an opinion about whether you like it or not. Is it something that you'd want to, would you probably own it and put it in your collection, or what is the one that's like, eh, doesn't do anything for me? And there are probably people in both camps who are paying attention to our uh, class right now. So, here are some pricing trends at the time that we put this PowerPoint together. Um, in, in an AU50 grade, this is a $600 coin. In MS60, it was a $1,000 coin. And in MS63, it was uh, $1,800 at the time that this uh, was put together. These are the pricing trends for that coin. So my question to you is, based on this knowledge, how much do you think this coin at auction sold for? And the answer is, it sold for $3,000. Why? Well, the answer is, there were at least two people who were involved in this auction who really liked the toning on that coin. And that's all it takes is two people. Well, what's interesting is that in the 1980s and early 1990s, people did not like toning. 
toning was uh, sort of taboo, and people took a lot of toned coins and cleaned them so that they became blazing white. Um, today, the tide has turned a little bit. There is still a significant amount of people who like blazing white coins. But there are also a lot of people who like toned coins. And uh, this is an example of that. There were, again, there were two people, at least two, in this auction who really liked the toning found on this particular coin. The one thing that I want to caution you about toning is, and, and I like toning, right? is that um, when you're grading coins, toning can hide many sins. can hide scratches, can hide wear. So when you're looking at a toned coin, you have to develop the wherewithal to be able to look underneath the toning to look for problems. Initial points of wear. Initial points of wear are generally the highest points of a coin. Remember that when we're looking for wear, we're looking for a change of color, which equals luster disturbance. There's a flattening of the design. Um, you have to be careful to remember that you're looking for wear versus a weak strike. And the way that you can do all of this is by looking at a lot of coins. A lot of people have asked me in the past, if a coin is slabbed, does that mean it will not tone? And the answer is no. Um, there have been recent developments to try to make slabs as watertight as possible. The coins are not airtight, airtight or in most instances, uh, most instances, completely watertight. Here's an example. This is a coin that I actually have. This is my coin. Um, the, uh, this was, a uh, picture's taken of this coin about 10 years ago, obverse and reverse. Notice the label, MS63, 100% white. Notice that there is actually toning on this coin. It's not 100% white. So that was a picture taken 10 years ago. On the left is a picture taken five years ago. And on the right was a picture taken just last year. Notice the progression and the darkness of the toning. Okay. So can that happen in coins? Absolutely. That's why the third-party grading companies are often reluctant to use the red, red-brown moniker on cents because through no fault of their own, suppose they slab a coin and label it red and that coin is shipped off to a, a, a state where there's a lot of humidity. Let's say it's sent to Florida and you're not careful with that coin and it's subject to the humidity. That coin's going to change uh, inside the holder as this coin has done. Okay. Okay. Here's an example of a uh, Morgan dollar that <clears throat> excuse me has been listed as AU50. What does that mean? Well, it's the lowest of the almost uncirculated grades. And the reason it is is because even though it's hard to see, there's a lot of discoloration, a lot going on in the fields of the coin. There's also significant wear above the ear. It's a well-struck coin, but there's a, a good deal of loss of luster um, in the fields on this particular coin, hence the AU50 grade. You can see where it is that the arrows are pointing to show you. Again, we focus on the focal points. There is where a loss of definition both on the eel's breast and the, the hair above the ear on the obverse. A lot of people at first looking at this coin may consider it to be mint state, but there is some discoloration and there is some wear. Um, if you talk to Bill Fever, he would tell you that the way to grade buffalo nickels is to look at the reverse first. And that's what he does. And if we look at the reverse here, we can spot some discoloration. There's some discoloration at the end of the tail. And um, there's also what is called the Mesa effect. And the Mesa effect is if you, uh, at the hip of the uh, bison, uh, if there's a flattening of the hip, like a Mesa, um, 
in geography, uh, geology, excuse me, then um, uh, th that's a show of wear. For me, if I'm looking at the obverse, I see discoloration above the, uh, the eye, where the eyebrow area is. And, and that's my tip to see that this coin has a slight amount of wear uh, due to this discoloration, hence the AU58 grade. Here are the areas that you would look for to determine if there's initial wear to help determine whether this is an AU coin or a mid-state coin. And again, Bill says to look at the reverse, and you know what? I believe, Bill, if someone put a gun to my head and said, uh, this Indian head has to be graded accurately, we're going to pull the trigger, um, Bill would be my guy to grade the coin. Here's a $20 uh, classic head gold piece. And where are we looking for initial wear on this particular coin? Well, for me, again, um, I look at the hair above the Liberty crown. Um, that's where I see some wear and some discoloration initially. Uh, that's what I'm looking for. And, and, and again, the reason we're going through this is it's so important for you to know your series uh, in and out so that you can spot these points of initial wear easily and accurately. Okay, and there are the spots that you would look for, both on the hours and reverse of initial wear. These coins are hard, especially during this time period, because uh, they tend to be very weakly struck. And so it's very difficult, even sometimes for experienced graders, to be able to tell the difference between a coin that has been weakly struck and a coin that shows initial wear. Again, the way that you're going to look at this coin is uh, Liberty Walking half dollars. You're going to look for discoloration. One of the spots that you can often find discoloration on the obverse is in the field right behind Lady Liberty. So if we're looking at the, if you and I are looking at the coin right now, we'd say it's to the right, our right, in the field of Lady Liberty. You're going to find discoloration there. Why? That's just generally where people held the coin. And on the reverse, if you look at the eagle's um, the forefront leg, the leg that is closest to us, you'll notice that there's discoloration there. Okay, this is where you see the discoloration. Done this before. Where do we, what are the focal points? Where are we looking for where within the, the St. Gaudens gold pieces? There they are. We talked about the knee. We talked about the breast on the obverse. Those are the focal points. Those are the high points. And the eagle, the eagle's breast, and the wings at the top. All these are focal point areas where you're going to see initial wear. Coins do generally wear the same. And I mean that within their, their own series. Uh, you're, again, you're going to look for the diagnostics for a particular grade. There are certain series that are just difficult. Uh, early copper coins, 20 cent pieces, standing Liberty quarters. But because of the design, um, you have to be careful. Uh, they're not the, the typical designs that you would find with other coins. You really have to know these series well. And of course, there are early copper uh, collectors who sort of have a grading language all of their own. And that's important to understand. Okay, here's a Morgan dollar. It's, it's graded at, at MS67, okay? What that means is, as a 67, we call this a wow coin. And we call this a wow coin because that means that the, uh, when you look at it, you say, wow. The strength of strike is remarkable. The lack of detractors, you can't find them anywhere, or hardly anywhere, and it's fully lustrous. This is what an MS67 coin looks like. Here's a 65. Okay, not quite as lustrous. There are some hits in the field. They're very small, and they're in out-of-the-way places. Um, again, a, this is a great coin, a 65. There's nothing wrong with it. So you'd want to, uh, uh, th this is a high grade for a coin. Not as high as the 67, 
but uh, still a very uh, highly graded coin. Here's the 63. In the course of mint state coins, we call the grade of 63 your average coin. In other words, if we had examples of the 100 coins, uh, 100 Morgan dollars, you would find that the vast majority of them would probably be graded as 63. This is your average mint state grade. Yes, there are some hits in the fields. Yes, there are some slight hits in places that are obvious to our eye and focal points. Still a mint state coin. Um, and it's still a really nice coin. I mean, I, who would want a uh, Carson City 1879? But um, there are some detractors to it, hence its grade of MS-63. This is an MS-60 coin. This coin's been hit by the ugly stick. UGLY ain't no alibi. This is an ugly coin. Why? Well, there's hits all over the place. There's loss of luster. Uh, this, is, this is a problem coin. It's a problem coin not because it's an error. It just looks like a coin that's been uh, on the in a truck bed, a gravel truck bed, for a couple of hours. It's got a lot of hits to it. Um, if you have an MS60 coin, it's a problem coin. You may like the coin, but I guarantee you, you're going to have a lot of trouble uh, selling it when it comes time. Uh, it, it, it's just got a lot of detractors. It's just not a pleasing coin. Mint state, but not pleasing. Here's an AU55. Has some wear, very slight, but doesn't have nearly the hits, and it has probably more luster than the 60. That's important. If you're looking at an AU55, or more importantly, an AU58 coin, which is even better than this one, I would tell you that the AU58 coin has more eye appeal than a 60 or 61 mint state. I say that to you because there are a lot of people who are in the trap of, well, it's got to be mint state or I don't want that coin. And they're willing to accept a coin that's a 60 or 61, even though there's a perfectly acceptable 58 that probably would sell for equal or less money, but has much more eye appeal than a 60 or 61. So keep that in mind. Uh, a 55 or especially a 58 coin is a very attractive coin with very little wear. A 58 uh, coin translates to either a very high-end 63 or a 64 coin with just a little bit of wear. Here's an EF45. Notice that there's definite wear, definite loss of uh, difference of color. Um, the luster is not the same. It doesn't have many hits. It's a nice coin that just has some honest wear. I would, I would argue that it's still a very attractive coin. VF25, uh, hardly any luster, if any, left. Significant wear, not only in the uh, high points of the coin, but it's now reaching the lower areas. Um, no luster on this coin. Uh, again, significant wear. If you look at the detail near the rim, that is beginning to wear now. Here we see where the rim is actually flattening out almost into the field. Uh, again, a, a great amount of wear, especially you can see on the eagle. It really has attacked the wing. Uh, very little detail left. And then here's a good. You can see that the rim has encroached onto the field, that there's extremely little detail left. There's a, of course, there's absolutely no luster, and that's a good six coin. Okay. Next step for you. Please remember that learning never stops. That's one of the reasons that I enjoy teaching with the folks that I had mentioned in the beginning, because I learn a, a lot when I'm teaching. Um, there are advanced courses. Not only are there the, the in live courses, there's the fundamental course, which, again, we teach uh, the different grades, uh, market grading, technical grading. We use uh, completely problem-free coins. Uh, once you take that class, then you're eligible to take the um, intermediate class, where they deal more exclusively with mint state coins. And they also begin introducing problem coins. And then once you take that, then you can uh, finish up by taking the advanced courses. 
um, where they deal with problem coins and, and, and how to work with them. Um, so that's important. Listen to experienced dealers. Talk to them. Most of them, uh, the most experienced numismatists are very willing with their time and talents to be able to help you. I know when I talk with Ken Brissett, um, and if anybody, you know, Ken Brissett is probably won every numismatic award there is to win, yet Ken is very free with his time and um, loves to help people. That, that's just what he loves to do. And I've found that the people who are really titans of the industry are like that. There are plenty of people who won't give you the time of day. They're not nearly as important in my world as the real titans like Bill Fever and Ken Brissett who do give you their time of day and, and do like to help you. Those are the people that you want to listen to. Um, okay, so uh, I'm ready for any questions that we may have. Look at that. We're straight at 1 o'clock. That's pretty cool. So um, if we can take uh, – are we okay for the next 15 minutes, Brianna? Okay, let's yeah. go. So before I do that, I'm going to launch the survey in case anybody needs to go. I'm going to launch the survey now. It's 10 questions, multiple choice. Please on, answer it honestly so we can um, take your feedback and improve on these. Um, so please just listen to the questions as they come through while you're filling out the survey. And um, if you do have to go, we just thank you for your time that you've been with us today. Uh, we will have this on our website at some point. We don't have a date just yet, but we will put it on our website as soon as we can. Um, so we're going to jump into questions now. Yeah, um, before, before you do that, Brianna, if you don't mind, um, if, you're ready to, if you're getting ready to leave, I, I do want to thank you. I know that we all have very busy lives, and I want to thank you for taking part of your busy life and spending it with me. And I hope you had some fun, and I hope that you ran across some things that were of interest to you. And most importantly, I hope that I've sort of uh, set the stage for you to consider uh, taking one of the live classes where you can work with the coins um, and have a lot of fun, because we do do that. It's important, I believe, for us not only to learn, right, but it's also important for us to have some fun. And uh, the, very fortunately, the people that I work with believe the same thing. We do. We have a great deal of fun. So I'd like for you to be able to join, join that with us. Okay, Brianna. All right. The next question you have, there are multiple guides about grading coins within a specific series. Is there such a guide for grading commemorative coins, or is a grading for that series based on generic grading guidelines? Boy, what a, what a, what a question. So um, I, I happen to collect... Um, I happen to collect commemorative coins, um, the old series, and um, it's very hard because you know you're looking at a different design for each series. Um, there are some books out there uh, from people who who have um, who deal com who deal exclusively with just uh, commemorative coins. Um, Anthony Swiatek comes to mind. And so I'm sure that there are books out there that, that go over in a very cursory mode some things to look at. Um, as a matter of fact, he has a coin encyclopedia, commemorative coin encyclopedia. And with each coin, he spends a little bit of time talking about how to differentiate mint state from um, coins that have been circulated. He often uses the term abused uh, in some form or matter. He doesn't go into the uh, specifics of this coin is an AU as opposed to this coin is an XF. Uh, but he does talk about things to look for when you're uh, looking for wear on a on commemorative coins. So my answer is yes, they are out there. Um, I would look uh, for books uh, written by Anthony um, because he seems to be the person who um, has dealt with this subject, who's dealt with this subject the most. <clears throat> um, and but yeah, I think you can find that. Good question. What is hub doubling? Okay. So um, I'm so glad that you brought this question up because there's one thing that I failed to mention in the class, and I want to mention this now. And that is, you know, we talked about uh, once you're finished, when once you're finished taking a fundamentals of grading course, that there are other courses that are available for you to take. Intermediate and advanced grading. My advice to you, and I think this is good advice, is before you take those more advanced classes, that you give some heavy consideration into taking a course called the Modern Minting Process. And here's the reason. I firmly believe that if you have a good grounding 
and how coins are manufactured, then it's much easier for you to be able to grade coins. Now, fortunately, one of our e-learning classes is going to be the modern minting process, and our numismatic educator, Sam Gelbert, is going to teach that. And I'm sure, I know Sam, he's taking the, uh, the live modern minting process class himself, so I'm sure that he's going to do a fine job. If you take the modern minting process here at headquarters during summer seminar, then the person who you're going to learn from under is probably pre the preeminent person who understands the minting process, and that's Dr. James Wiles. And uh, that's a really good class to take um, because it helps you. To answer your question more specifically, when you're dealing with um, how a coin is processed, um, you have what is called a master hub. And the master hub creates a master die. And then the master die creates a working hub and the working hub finally creates working dies. Why does the mint do that? Well, it's a cost-saving measure because if they didn't, if they did in any other way, they constantly have to create master hubs. What does that mean for us? Well, that means that once there is doubling that is in a master hub, that's going to work its way all the way down to the um, to the working dies that are, are going to be found. Usually, doubling, if doubling happens during the process, you, usually the doubling is going to happen um, during the process where uh, it, it hits the master die. And the master die, uh, the, all of the working hubs and working dies that are created after the master die is also going to contain that doubling. Usually, that's where that takes place. But again, to find out more information on this, I, I really think that it's an excellent play to consider not only attending uh, Sam's e-learning class, um, but I also believe that it's an excellent play to consider taking Dr. Wiles' live uh, class on, um, on the modern minting process. You really can't go wrong. How is the best way to tell if a coin has been cleaned? Ah, great question. So, um, basically, it depends on how the coin has been cleaned. If the coin has been cleaned through solutions, jewel luster, um, what happens is that there'll eventually be a flattening out of the luster and um, uh, there'll be a shininess to the coin. That's not luster. People often confuse luster with shininess and they're not the same at all. Okay? The other way is if people actually wipe a coin is that there'll be what are called hairlines. And hairlines are created by wiping across the surface of the coin. And if you see hairlines that are not in relief, okay, hairlines are actually in the coin, embedded in the coin, then that, there's a good chance that that coin has been cleaned, um, being wiped at some point. The, one of the most severe ways of cleaning a coin is what is called whizzing where you take an actually hard object and um, you scrape across the coin to bring this shininess. And the way you can often tell a whiz coin is because the, the whizzing is so aggressive that actual particles of the coin will be lying across the, um, primary, uh, the, the primary area of the, uh, of the design of the coin. And, and that's the way you can tell, um, that's the way you can tell whizzing. Great question. How do you di di differentiate wear features from strike weaknesses features? Well, I'm sorry, run that by me again? Um, how do you di differentiate wear features from strike weakness features? Yeah, well, again, that, 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 that's, a, that's a good question. And the only thing that I can impart onto you are two things. Number one, know your series. Know, for example, that when you're looking at a coin that is from uh, New Orleans, that they wanted to extend the life, so chance, there's a good chance that you're going to find a weakness there. Number two, um, besides knowing your series, is you're going to have to be on the lookout for a change of color. When you have a weakly struck coin, there's still going to be luster there. It's just not going to be as fully lustrous as the place where the uh, dyes made full contact. 
but that doesn't mean that the color's different. When you're looking at wear, you're, you're most often looking at a complete change of color, and that's a tip-off that something has happened there, that that's where wear has, has taken place. Is doing that easy? Absolutely not. It's going to take a lot of time and a lot of practice, but I promise you that knowing your series will go a long way into helping you get over that initial hump. What about a stereoscope for looking at coins? Yeah. You know, uh, again, um, th those items are great. Um, I firmly believe when you're just doing grading, it's called overkill. And what's going to happen is that you're going to um, pick up on detractors that uh, normally you wouldn't find through just your eye or a um, five or seven loop. And what I find is that people who use them for grading initially are going to uh, undergrade, undergrade their coins. Um, and, you know, that's a good point that you bring up because when you begin to grade coins, um, there's, this, there's this idea in your head that I've really, I, I can't miss anything. Because if I miss something when I'm attributing a grade to this coin, that I'm going to look foolish. I understand that. My advice to you is this. When you're looking at a coin, determine what is right about the coin before you start looking for detractors. And if you determine what is right about the coin first, you're going to find that generally you're going to hone in on an actual correct grade much, easy, much more easily and much more quickly. What happens if the obverse should get one grade and the reverse deserves a different grade? Yeah, again, we were talking about that that's um, net grading. Net grading does exist, but not many people like it. Um, again, it's generally what the money side, the, the grade of the money side is, is what the grade of the coin is going to be. So it, uh, unless, it's, uh, unless it's really way off. Whatever the grade of the money side is, that's the grade. And, and in most instances, remember what I said, the reverse can never help the grade, but it can only hurt. How might you suggest practicing the art of co uh, grading coins? Yep. So first of all, the first thing I would do is I would decide on a series. Um, and if and if you're you know your your object is just to become better at grading in general, you know pick a series that that doesn't require a lot of money, so that you can um, uh, acquire a, a significant amount of those coins uh, to be able to grade them, and then you know just go to work and um, you know attributing grades to the coins that you see once you become familiar with the focal points of that particular uh, of that particular coin, and you're familiar with the things that you look out for, um, place that in play, and, and begin working at it. There really is no substitute. And we can talk about you know, theories behind grading as we have today. And hopefully you've, you've got something from this, but we can do this now until the cows come home, but it's never going to be as good as actually having coins in front of you and looking at them and, and getting used to determining what a VG uh, Lincoln cent looks like or what an XF um, barber dime looks like. There's nothing that's going to get pa you, you past that until you just actually graded, which is why when we teach the grading class, um, we put a lot of coins in front of you. We, we, you know, we do give you some theory in the beginning. But I guarantee you, most of the time that you're going to spend with us, you're going to spend in front of coins looking at them because there's just no other way to get around it. Let's take one more. Is there some leniency in grading early coins with respect to light cleaning? Uh, can you run that by me again? I'm sorry. Is there some leniency in grading early coins with respect to light cleaning? That's a great question. Boy, I love this question. I was just thinking about this yesterday. So um, my answer is sometimes. Um, so, you know, there's always the idea of has this coin been cleaned? And if the coin has been cleaned, how long ago and how severe was the cleaning? Okay. Um, 
here's a tip for you. When we're talking about Morgan dollars, for example, I know that the vast majority of them, some people have set up to 90% of Morgan dollars have been cleaned at one time or another. Very few Morgan dollars are in their original skin. A lot of it may have occurred during those 80s and 90s that we talked about when, you know, there was just such disfavor with, um, with uh, coins that had been toned. And so it could have been something innocent like that. So there, when you use Morgan dollars, for example, there are very few coins that um, have not been cleaned at some time or another. Some people don't like to use the term clean. They like to use the term conserve. Okay. We're looking at ancient coins, for example. I can tell you that pretty much every ancient coin has been cleaned at one time or another. Because you've got to remember that chances are they've been sitting below the ground for, you know, uh, 1,500 years or something like that. And so pretty much every ancient coin has been conserved or cleaned um, at one time or another. Um, I was looking at a bus dollar, an early bus dollar, and it was gunmetal gray. looked really good. And it was graded as being uh, clean. And, um, you know, I just don't know about that. Because the cleaning had to have happened a very long time ago. And maybe it's my fault. I'm, I'm certainly willing to say that that's an option. But boy, you know, I, I had to look at it very carefully to pick up any trace of cleaning. Um, so it, it can happen. So my answer to you is this, that, um, that yes, there generally is a little bit of leeway with older coins. Um, and I don't know quite why that is, except to say that probably if it is encountered a cleaning, it, is, it happened um, a while ago, and maybe toning has taken over some of the places where you'd be able to tell where that coin has been cleaned, which, again, is another reason why I've mentioned that you always want to look underneath the toning of a coin because um, you need to be able to pick up on problems underneath the toning because toning is, uh, is a real great way to hide the, um, the problems of, uh, that you might encounter with coin. I uh, want to tell everybody that I, I've had a great time today with you. I, I hope that you've enjoyed at least parts of it. Um, you've asked some great questions, really have. And uh, if you have a question, again, that you really need an answer to, um, if you want to send it to gillisandmoney.org, I'll uh, be happy to help you. If I get an influx, a lot of them, I may not be able to answer right away but I'll do my best to answer those questions. And again, before you leave, I can't stress more highly that if you have the opportunity to take one of our live classes, you're only going to be sorry about one thing. You're going to be sorry about why you didn't take the class sooner because you're going to learn a lot and you're going to have a lot of fun. So I want to thank everybody again for spending the time with me and, uh, and, and, and have fun with your collecting. Well, like Rod said, if you have already sent in a question and we couldn't get to it today, um, they are recorded through Zoom, so I will send those to Rod here soon after so you can get those answered and I will get those out to you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today, and thank you, Rod, for um, your time and expertise on this. My pleasure. Thank you, Brianna. With that, I, want to thank every, I want to thank Brianna because without Brianna, this doesn't happen. She is the driving force behind this, so thank you. Thank you, Rod. Yeah. Um, we have a certificate of appreciation for you, Rod, that I'll get to you soon. Um, if you have further questions, like Rod said, you can send them to him or you can send them to seminars.money.org and I can get them passed over to him. If you haven't finished on the polls, um, please do soon. We're going to close out pretty soon. The next class that we have is going to be CAC and its Green Beans with Bob Bear. I saw some questions come through about those specifically, so I recommend you jumping on. That's going to be tomorrow, 1 p.m. Uh, Mountain Time, so jump on that. I did add the link earlier to the chat for all the other classes coming up, so jump on there. Sign up for the classes that you can, and we hope you enjoyed, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.